Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling Probability Measure. And in this video, we're going to look at the measure length as a set function on the reels. Now, a few desirable properties for length as a measure is this, that it's, there's, there's four criteria here. One, that it's defined on all subsets of R. If we're looking at an interval, then the length is actually sort of the standard measure, B minus A, so the length of the interval. We want it translation invariant, so if we have an interval here and we add the same quantity and just move it, the length of this interval should be the length of this interval. It's translation invariant. And we also want it sigma additive in the fact that sometimes called countably additive, that if we're adding disjoint sets or the union of disjoint sets, the measure of that union should actually just be the sum of those disjoint intervals or disjoint sets. So what's sigma additive? Now, a few notes is unfortunately this is impossible. <clears throat> and this is 100% why we need to develop a structure for subsets of R. And then what we do is we define measures on simple subsets, say a field of R, and then we uniquely extend it to bigger and larger sets. So maybe we extend it to a sigma field, and then a complete sigma field. And, and this, is, this is actually how Lebesgue measures develop from length. And, and we'll get more into this in the next you know, five or six videos. But I want to show you a, an example of why this doesn't work for all subsets. And it's really inspired by a YouTube video from Professor Claudio Landon. And uh, it, it illustrates that length doesn't satisfy all these properties of subsets for it. And this is actually the, the classic example of a subset of R that is not Lebesgue measurable. And again, why we have to develop this rich, rich structure of subsets of R. So let's let X and Y be real numbers and call X and Y equivalent if the difference, X minus Y, is rational. And we, and we write it like this, X is equivalent to Y. So we define the equivalence class as all Y's in, in, the, in R such that y minus x is rational, and Q, script Q is the symbol for rational numbers. Now we want to form a new set, A, by just picking one value from each equivalence class x. And there's an infinite number of equivalence classes. Now let's assume that the chosen value from each equivalence class is such that a is between 0 and 1. And then we're going to let alpha and beta be elements of this set that we'll need in, in a bit. Now, a note is how, how do we know that A can be contained in the subset, you know, the interval 0 to 1? Now, this isn't part of the video. This is just my illustration of, of why. Now, all rationals are in the same equivalence class, right? Any, the difference of two rational numbers is rational. And so it's easy to pick one of those in the interval 0 to 1 to include in A, which is a subset of 0 to 1. Now let's look at the equivalence class of pi, which we know is irrational. Pi is 3.1415926, blah, 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 blah. So if we look at this number where we take off the 3, Otherwise, it's identical. And we subtract the two numbers, we get 3, which is rational. So, so this number is in the equivalence class of pi. So we can pick that one, you know, to be in A. But there's a kajillion different ways and, you know, for numbers to be in the equivalence class of pi. For example, let's change one decimal. So normally pi, there's a 1 here, but let's change it to a 0. So 3.0415265 
And if we, and if we subtract these two numbers, we get 0.1, which is one-tenth, which is rational. So this number is in the equivalence class of pi. So this should be enough to illustrate why we can pick numbers that are between 0 and 1. Now, um, something that I don't have here and I just thought of, this is a quote that I absolutely love. It's not my quote, but if you go out at night and you look up into the dark sky and you see the stars, those are the rational numbers. And the blackness between the stars are the irrational numbers. That's how vast the irrational numbers are to the rational numbers. It's the blackness in the sky. Um, so now, let's let R and S be rational numbers that aren't equal. And we want to show that this subset is the empty set. The intersection of these two subsets is an empty set. And we're going to prove it by contradiction. So let's assume there is an X in this inter, uh, intersection, meaning you know it's not the empty set. This implies that X is alpha plus R, right? There's an alpha in here, and you know plus R, which is X, and there's uh, an X is a, is a beta plus S, you know, and beta is in A. Hence. These two numbers are the same. So if we subtract beta over and subtract r over, which makes me think this is backwards, <laughs> but regardless, then beta, alpha minus beta is rational because these are two rational numbers. Now since r minus s is rational, that says alpha and beta are equivalent. But this is a contradiction because we picked, you know, a unique alpha and beta in the set A, which contains one value from each equivalence class. So alpha and beta can equal. So this is a contradiction. So thus, this intersection is the empty set. Now, since the union of A plus Q, right, we're, we're going to let Q be a rational number between minus 1 and 1. And since A is between 0 and 1, and Q is between minus 1 and 1, th the union of these sets is between minus 1 and 2. So that tells us the measure of this union is less than or equal to this interval, but the, but the measure of this interval is 3. So now if we look at the measure of this union, these are all dis, disjoint, or, uh, right? They're, they're intersection zero. We just proved it in, in part I. So that means that we can sum the measures of each of those sets, right? But since the measure is translation invariant, this is just the measure of A. Now we're infinitely summing some number that's less than or equal to three, right? And the only way that's possible is if this is zero. But that implies that this is zero. Now we want to claim that the interval zero to one is contained in this sum. Or, yeah. Now, right, these are all disjoint, so this is like the union of these uh, s sets. So let's let x be in this interval, 0 to 1. Thus, there exists an alpha that's in the intersection between a and x, right? So if we pick one of these elements in this equivalence class to be in a, and we intersect it, that one element is alpha. So this implies that alpha is between 0 and 1, but x minus alpha is a rational number, right? That's, that's how we define the equivalence class, and that's what x, you know, if alpha minus, you know, x has to be rational, 
call it Q. So Q is a rational number. But this implies that Q has to be between negative 1 and 1. You know, if you look at these, this is between 0 and 1, and this is between 0 and 1. So it has to be between negative 1 and 1. So hence, 1 is equal to the measure of this interval, 0 to 1, which is less than or equal to the, this union, right? which is a contradiction, right? This, inter this interval can't be greater than or equal to 1 and equal to 0 all at the same time. So it's a contradiction. Uh, so therefore, it's not possible to have a mu satisfy all these properties. It's just not possible. So a few Indian notes. I mean, this, this is the classic example of a set that's not Lebesgue measurable. So in your uh, measure theory classes, the, I'm, my guess is this example will be provided or given. So the goal of the next few vid videos is to develop a theory and nomenclature to uniquely extend a measure from fields to sigma fields to potentially complete sigma fields. And this sigma field is going to end up being what's called the Borel sets. Now, field, it's, it's easy to define a measure that's well-defined on a field. Then to uniquely extend that to a sigma field is not straightforward, but that's what we're going to show. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I sure did. Please like it and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks, bye.